It's a privilege, isn't it, to worship the Lord together with God's people and to sing together. Uh, music is a wonderful gift that God has given to us to sing the wonderful words. And music by itself has its own language or is its own language, but it is a support for the wonderful words of life that we find in Scripture, which are wonderful words not just because they're aesthetically pleasing, sometimes they're deeply disturbing. Mm -hmm. But they are wonderful because they come from the living God who te teaches us and tells us the truth so that uh, we do not have to be aimless in our lives and, and wonder how we should respond to the challenges of today and tomorrow that we have direction in light of eternity. And that's what we want to spend some time doing this afternoon to talk about Judgment Day. <laughs> This morning, San Francisco, I always call him, uh, spoke about the anger of God. And that's not really our focus this evening, but we do want to think about our accountability to a God who loves us and does not equivocate about our lives if we have trusted him. So let me begin with a question. Do you expect, wherever you are on the map, in terms of your relationship with God, one day to be judged in the presence of Jesus? Do you expect a face-to-face -face encounter where there will be judgment? Now that's a trap question. Because if you have put your trust in Christ, you do not have to fear judgment. On the other hand, there is what the Bible calls, in the New Testament in particular, calls the tribunal, the bima, the bema, seat, judgment. If you have known the Lord Jesus Christ for some time, you have certainly come across that wonderful passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 which tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. No condemnation. And this verse assures us that because Jesus has paid fully for the debt of our sin, and because he has experienced in six short hours on the cross the outpouring of the wrath of his Father, on his account, he became sin for us. Because that is true, we don't have to expect, and we must not uh, fear eternal punishment in the future. Amen. Christ has paid for that. He has taken, taken it fully on his shoulders. He has paid up our debt in full. And so there is no condemnation for us. That's a piece of good news. Amen. Then we come to another passage in Colossians 3. And we've been studying in Colossians, haven't we, in the past year. But take a peek at Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 25, which we've already spoken about in Pastor Sam's messages on this chapter. But just a reminder of Colossians 3, 23. Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. There is no respect of persons. Colossians 3 is addressed to believers in the church of Jesus Christ in that city of Colossae, who, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, need fear no condemnation, and yet must remember that there is nonetheless in some shape a recompense for the deeds done in the body. So how do those things fit together? Is there a contradiction? <clears throat> well, if there's a contradiction, then I suppose we're in deep trouble because then there is condemnation, right? And Paul was wrong in Romans 8.1. But there 
is no contradiction because God has perfect integrity. He never lies. He never deceives. He's never confused about what he wants to communicate to us. So there is another way for us to see how these passages, these truths, fit together in Scripture. Paul is certainly giving us a broad principle at the end of Colossians 3. And the principle can apply both to believing slaves and to believing masters. And the principle is that God is not partial to certain people. That's the conclusion of the paragraph. For God is not a respecter of persons. God is not partial to certain people. In this world, if you're a master, you're respected in the, in the community, you are maybe a landowner, and you own many people in the Roman society. If you're a slave in ancient Rome, you're a chattel, you're a property, and you could be bought and sold like you would buy or sell a watch in the pawn shop. But God is not a respecter of persons. He is not partial to certain people. He will recompense all of us for the good or evil done in the body with perfect justice and truth. N nor is God particularly partial to slaves. We're living in a culture today where it is popular for people to say that there is some virtue for being poor or having been oppressed maybe several generations ago. And one should receive payment, financial recompense today for injustices done many centuries ago in other countries. We're all kind of victims. So, you know, if you're a slave, you're kind of a higher citizen. Maybe God will be favorable to slaves more than favorable to masters because, after all, Masters are the oppressors, and the slaves are the oppressed. No, no, God is not particularly favorable to slaves either. God is no respecter of persons. We will all receive the reward of our inheritance if we know the Lord. And it has nothing to do with our social standing in this life. That's Colossians 3. Mm -hmm. But this does not really fully answer the tension that we talked about just a moment ago between condemnation, that is, final judgment for being against God and being eternally separated from God if we do not love His Son enough to trust Him, or being brought into God's presence eternally because we do love His Son and do trust Him. How, how is it possible that those who are brought into God's presence also experience some kind of examination. God reveals some of the answers to the, those questions in several New Testament passages about the future Bema seat judgment. Before we come to three of them in particular, I'd like to underscore this afternoon, let me just say a word about the Bema. This is a transliteration of a term Paul used in the Greek language of his day, the common language, the language that was used every day in the marketplace. If you go to the city of Corinth and wander through uh, the remnants of this ancient city, you'll come to a raised platform there, and on the uh, front of this raised platform, which is, I suppose, about as big as this uh, staging area here, but about, well, maybe this high off the ground, you'll see a tag that says Bema. And the Bema was the judgment seat. A judge would have his chair in the middle of the Bema, and people could come to him at certain hours of the day and plead their cause. And he would render a judgment. Why was it called the Bema? It comes from a verb. Uh, baino, which means to go up. So the bema is a raised place. It is a place of where, where the judge is standing above the defendants and the prosecutor and renders a judgment. You see this uh, notion in the passages in the, in the Gospels about how Jesus was taken to Pontius Pilate and Pilate was seated on the bema, the raised platform, ready early in the morning to 
uh, render judgments. Um, that's in Matthew 27, 19, and John 19, 13, in case you want to check it out yourself. We also see a reference to this kind of thing in Acts 7, 5, the platform for Abraham's feet, or Acts 12, 21, uh, Herod, King Herod takes his place on the rostrum. And, and ironically, that's where he himself uh, is struck with worms, he's eaten the worms and dies. It's a, no, it's a, you don't want to have that happen to you when you're seated in the raised platform. And uh, in Acts 18, verses 12, 16, and 17, you see that the Jews attack Paul before uh, Gallio at the judgment seat in Corinth, actually, in that very Bema. Festus sits in judgment over Paul in Acts 25. It's a term that's used very often in the New Testament, and you see the import of it. It's a place where you want to make sure you're on the right end of the law or you're in trouble. In two important New Testament passages, we see this term used for Christ's judgment in the life of the believer. This is not going to be a judgment that will condemn us, but to commend us and to recompense us. And that is why Romans 8, 1 and Colossians 3, 23 to 25 fit together. Because the purpose of the judgment seat is to strike a match, so to speak, to the deeds done in the life of a believer to test them so that we may be commended to God and, and recompensed. And so this is a source of encouragement. And it is also um, a set of passages that should cause us to think about our priorities. We are saved by grace. We do not need to fear condemnation, but there will be a day when we will give account for the deeds done in the body. So let's look at these passages, beginning in Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 14. Romans 14, and I want you to look at verse 9. Romans 14, verse 9. Of course, you're familiar with the context here in Romans 14. This is an extended section in chapters 14 and 15 where Paul is talking about the problems that Jews and Gentiles had in getting along in the Roman church. It was a time of great stress because Jews like to do things a certain way, and they tended to be very legalistic. Gentile converts in the church in Rome had come from a very permissive uh, background and did not have uh, this black and white, good and evil kind of worldview. They certainly didn't know anything about you must worship on Shabbat, or you may eat of this, and you may not eat of that, or you may drink this, you may not drink that, and, and all of the other implications. And so in the Church of Rome, they tended to be critical of each other and impatient with one another. And Paul is trying to appeal to them that whether we live or die, we live to the Lord and we die to the Lord. Verse 9, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, he was brought to life that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema of the Messiah. For it is written, and now we have a quotation, from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess, shall be in agreement before God about who I am and about the message of the gospel. So then, verse 12, Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall 
in his brother's way. Now here's the first key passage then. The Bema Seat judgment should humble us. Isn't that the thrust of Isaiah 45, 23? Every knee shall bow. That's an expression of humility. This week we took some of the uh, team from Luxembourg over to Michas. And Sam led us around the beautiful balcony where we looked out over the, uh, the, uh, the, sea, the seaside. And we had a splendid day, much clearer than it was yesterday when the Kalima was all over uh, Andalusia. And Sam said, uh, I'd like to take a picture of all of the couples. And the ladies should stand up by the metal fence. And all the men should bow their knees and make as if they're proposing marriage. <laughs> Why would a man bow his knee before his wife? Because he's making a humble request, right? Would you please marry me? And we had to quote this little Spanish say. That was very much a staged thing. But we all know that when you get on your knees, you are taking the position of humility. So when the Bible uses this uh, metaphor, every knee shall bow before me, and it's speaking about a gesture of ascent, and I'm smaller than you are. You know, this is very reassuring to know that, that God is never going to bow the knee before any of his enemies. In the end, he's victorious, and all knees will bow to him. And what is further to be underscored here is the fact that the, the Bema seat is Christ. It is not just God the Father, but it is the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world before whom every knee shall bow. Amen. Do you ever think about what that will be like? In your, uh, this very, it's very risky to try to imagine things that are going to be ahead of us and that, that we really don't fully understand. But have you thought about what it will be like to see the glorified Lord Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross and suffered for all the sins you've ever committed. And he will look at you. That's the way they must go. It's not just we're going to deal with masses, but there's going to be some kind of a personal confrontation. And I think that's very clear in this passage. We shall all stand before the judgment seat. And it's interesting that he uses the word stand, and then in the following quotation talks about bending the knee. Um, there, there will be humility, and yet we will be able to stand before Christ's judgment seat because of the righteousness of the judge, which is given to us as a gift. There will be examination. We're going to give an account of ourselves before God. And as a result, the application in the text is don't, don't be the judge of one another. Don't be the examiner. We tend in, in the Lord's work and the Lord's ministry to want to set ourselves up as the judges of one another's motivations and conduct. And Paul gives a warning about that. Don't, don't do that. Remember the lesson of the Bema seat. Number one, it should humble us. There's a second passage I'd like you to look at briefly. It's in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 5, which also refers to the Bema seat. It should also encourage and sober us. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. In his first letter to the Corinthian church, and we're going to go to that in just a moment, Paul wrote that whether believers were at home with the Lord after death or still in their bodies, and he underscores it here again, verse 6 and verse 8, we need to seek to be pleasing to him. Let's read in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4. 
We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the same, the selfsame things, God, who also hath given unto us the earnest or the down payment of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat, the bema of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror or the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We seek to be pleasing to the Lord. The, the background of the language that's used here to please the Lord is related to what is fitting or, or what what's a what what um, is joined together in a, in a pleasing acceptable way can you think of an everyday situation where something fits just right and you say yeah that's that's good when we moved our furniture from Luxembourg to Spain in that very long refrigerator truck, and some of the folks from Luxembourg can smile because they saw photos of this. And were you men there to help us move, right, on that um, that morning, Sunday morning? Sunday morning? Saturday morning? Whatever it was. Saturday morning. Saturday morning, that's right, with Harold and I left on Sunday. <clears throat> uh, one of the, the little items of furniture that we decided to remove from our bathroom in Rosa, in Luxembourg, was a, a little white cabinet which um, we could have easily replaced here, but because uh, I have some uh, noticeable Dutch roots, I decided there was no reason to replace it here. It was a perfectly good piece of furniture. We would find a place to put it, and it uh, kind of stayed in the little corner for a while until we really got things organized, and I discovered that in the back closet in our bedroom where there were some uh, shelves that had been installed by the previous owner. There was a little space under a shelf that was about this high, and I thought, you know, I'll bet that white cabinet will just fit under there. And wouldn't you know it, it fit in with a millimeter of tolerance. It was just, it was well-pleasing. <laughs> wow, look at that. And I told Kathy, and uh, she was duly impressed with my ability to use a measuring tape <laughs> and figure out that it would just fit in there. And it just sl slid right in. That's the notion of being well-pleasing in the way that we live. And it is our desire to be well-pleasing, acceptable, efarestos, to God. Is that a, a, a good standard to use for measuring anything that we think or say or do in the course of the coming week? To be well-pleasing to the Lord, to please Christ in what we do. I don't think that it's easy to find a, a better standard, a more all-encompassing standard, a, 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 an overarching moral guideline. Than this one. Will Christ, who loved me and died for me, approve of my attitude and actions when I stand before him to give an account? If he will be pleased, then I must not abandon this. If he will be displeased, I must not pursue it. And this
this drives me forward <clears throat> because of what it says in verse 10. We must all, there are no exceptions here, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why does Paul say that? Because he knows that it is possible for us <clears throat> to step back on a daily basis and consider the, 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 the quality of our depth of commitment to Christ and to his word and the direction that we're going in and to weigh up whether the Lord Jesus Christ would be pleased or not. I can think about the day when I will appear before Christ's tribunal. Now there still is some guesswork here because as Paul says in some of his letters to the Corinthians, I don't even examine myself. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul himself was not sure about all of his own motivations. And he says, it matters very little to me if you and if you try to judge my motivations. I, I don't even judge myself. God knows everything, and he can make an objective assessment of our, our works, our attitudes, our motivations. But do that, he will. Look again at verse 10. <coughs> We must, what's the next word? All. all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, what he put there. So this particular assessment <coughs> will be individualized. Secondly, it will concern the deeds of the body. What have we done in the body? And it will include both kinds of deeds. It's very specific in the end of verse 10. According to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Do believers do good things? Yes, they do. Do believers do bad things? Yes, they do. It's interesting that those are the only two categories that are mentioned. <laughs> and the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is not to judge us for sin, because Jesus has fully paid for our guilt once for all, and nor is it a <clears throat> chastisement as a kind of Protestant purgatory that cleanses us of unconfessed venial sins, as opposed to the mortal sins that will send us to hell. There, there is no indication anywhere in Scripture that there are mortal sins and venial sins. Any sin will send us to the lake of fire. In fact, eating the fruit of a certain forbidden truth is enough to send you to the lake of fire. Nor do I believe that the Bema Seed is a a kind of a time of, of public exposure of unconfessed sins. But it is a future opportunity for Christ to reveal our motives. The means we have used to achieve our objectives. The motivations, the means we use, and the observable works as well. It's possible for us in the Christian life to work for the glory of God and not for ourselves. And when that happens, we receive a reward, a recompense. When we act by the empowering of God's Spirit instead of using fleshly means, we receive a reward. What is good will receive a reward. When God is permitted, because we yield to him, he's permitted to work through us, God rewards us, and there's a sense in which he's rewarding himself. But that's okay, because God's an e not an egotist. He graciously gives us a recompense for allowing us to uh, 
for, for our allowing him, I should say, to uh, use us to honor his name, and, and he accomplishes great things through us. We're the glove, and he's the hand. What is good will receive a reward, and what is bad, what is faulos, what is good for nothing or worthless, will not receive a reward, as we're going to see in the third passage. So the tribunal, the bema seat of Christ, is that place that should seek to humble us, but it is a place of encouragement and recompense and recognition. And we see in the first letter of Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that the data will evaluate what our Christian life will have been like. And I'd like us to think about five specific questions in regard to this future time and try to get some answers from this passage and from some related passages before we um, get back home and get ready to begin the week. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For no other foundation, uh, for no, sorry, for other foundation can no man lay than what is laid, or that is to say, what has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, you, we're not called to continue to lay different foundations. There is one foundation that has been laid for God's building. Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, that's one group. Group number two, wood, hay, stubble, two different groups, six different metaphors. Every man's work shall be made manifest, exposed, shown to be what it is. For the day shall declare it, the day shall reveal it. That is the day at the Bema when our works are examined. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try or test every man's work of what sort it is. If a man's work abide, which he hath built it thereupon, he shall receive a reward. That is, if it endures the test of the fire. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. When does this evaluation take place? There's an intriguing passage which we won't uh, turn to in Luke 14. You can check it out uh, yourself later on. In Luke 14, it talks about uh, the fact that the recompense for the just will occur at the resurrection. At the resurrection of the righteous, there is a recompense. And since the rapture of the church will be the moment when believers in Jesus Christ will be resurrected, the day of Christ, or the Bema Seat Judgment, will take place following this resurrection. Exactly how that's going to uh, take place, the Bible does not give us information. Are you going to queue up like at McDonald's? Well, no, McDonald's is not. That's a bad analogy. Where do you queue up? At the railroad station? We all queue up in all kinds of places, and we uh, patiently or impatiently wait our turn. Uh, is God limited by time and space in this? We, we don't know how God is going to work it out so that each of us appears before Christ during that time when there will be great tribulation, and God is going to be working during a, a seven-year period to purify the people of Israel and to pour out his wrath upon unbelieving nations. This evaluation of the Bema will occur on the day of Christ. This is the day that's referred to in 1 Corinthians 3, 13. The day shall declare. What day? Well, <clears throat> when the Lord comes. Um, there are many references in both Old Testament and New Testament to the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is, in the Old Testament, very often a re reference to the judgment day when God deals with his people Israel. Many New Testament passages talk about um, the day of 
Christ's return for the church are catching up to him. And that is when the Lord will come and we will stand before him. Revelation 22, 12 says, I come quickly, the idea is suddenly, and my reward is with me. When the Lord Jesus returns to catch up the church, his reward is with him, his recompense is with him. And so Peter is able to write in 1 Peter 5, 4, that when the chief shepherd appears, he will give the crown of glory to faithful elders, pastors, leaders in the church. When the shepherd appears, there is the recompense. When does the evaluation take place? When the church is caught up to be with Christ. And not before. So we wait for this. It's easy for us to size up one another, isn't it? <clears throat> and we can give recompenses to people whom we respect and whom we appreciate, and that's, that is appropriate. And we're always very humbled when uh, our friends from Luxembourg come down. We have a week of classes like this, and they give us a bouquet of flowers and uh, give a couple more books in, for my library, which I desperately need. <laughs> but I will very much appreciate the books that they decided to send our way. Uh, and th th that's a thank you. And it means a lot to us. But it is not a totally objective, final assessment of what we did this past week, right? Because who, who can make that kind of an assessment? How many people did we put to sleep? <laughs> on Thursday night or Wednesday night or on, you know, talking about scholasticism, I saw some people's eyes cross, you know, between 7.30 and 9.30 at night. Oh, my, do we have to go through this? And I suppose I wasn't very effective talking about that period of the late Middle Ages, and the Lord Jesus will have to assess that. And everything else that we have done during the week and everything that the rest of us are going to do with what we learned during the week about church history, we're not there yet. The, the final evaluation is future. How will the evaluation take place? The text tells us that this evaluation will be made by fire. Verse 13, it shall be revealed by fire. You say, oh, I thought you said that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And now, oh, we have to fear fire. No, the point is that the fire is applied to the works, not to us. This is obviously some kind of, I suppose we could say it's metaphorical speech, but I don't, I want to say this very carefully because what will be the fire that Jesus uses to test our works? Um, you know, he has eyes that are like coals of fire that burn and maybe it'll just be his gaze at us and everything that's dross will just evaporate I, I don't know how he's going to do this but you know that fire is a great test yeah. of value right? Uh, if you want to put um, a piece of clay uh, fine pottery like they make in Delft where I was born and you put that in the oven, and you turn up the heat after you put some glazing on it, and you pull it out, and the whole thing hasn't crumbled. It's, wow, that's a piece of porcelain face. That's dull blue. It survives the heat. But try putting my tie in there. <laughs> so Christ's gaze, or whatever method he uses to test our words, is going to be the means of his evaluation. The same fire that destroys worthless works will also approve worthy works. So what are those things that Christ will graciously reward? Again, let me just underscore a couple of things here that we've already stated, but they bear repeating. Number one, it is not we who are tested, but rather our deeds. It's very clear in the passage. Verse 13a, every man's work 
shall be made manifest, for that they shall declare it, because it, that is the work, shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. The focus is on the testing of our works. Number two, it does not appear that quantity is important in this passage, but the quality. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Paul could have used another metaphor here, guided by the Holy Spirit, to talk about the testing of works. He could have used the balance. Our works will be weighed. So how many good works do you need to have the balance go over here? Or maybe if it's too light, it's going to go over here, and then you're in trouble. That, that is not the metaphor that's used here to talk about the examination of our works. This is a test by fire. So you've got wood, hay, and stubble, which are subjected to the flame. They are worthless. They will be consumed. And gold, silver, and precious stones are not disturbed by the fire. They're going to last through the test as good. They are worthwhile. God is interested in the quality of our life, the, the quality of our fruit, of our walk with him. And the final test will determine that very objectively. You know, we are not at all objective in how we assess other people or even how we assess ourselves. Because everybody has known the Lord for a longer or shorter time. So those who are believers for a longer period are expected to mature more. Uh, not everybody has a Christian background, and so different people build on a foundation that can be very wobbly, and others have a Christian heritage that gives them a, a real head start in life, in the Christian life. And God expects more of this person than he does of that. And God gives us input from different teachers in our lives, and that's all different. And the more input we have from godly men and women, the more Christ expects of us. And those who have not experienced those same advantages, <coughs> God is just, he's not going to expect just as much from this person as he expects from that person. And some people have a learning problem or some other kind of handicap, and God knows those limitations. Some people cannot see, some people cannot hear, some people cannot speak. If, if you were born as an unseeing, deaf person, how are you going to be in touch with the gospel? You can't read anything on, a script, on, on the page of scripture. You can't hear someone give you a Bible message. You are locked into your own world. And there are people who have come to know the Christ, uh, Christ Jesus the Lord, uh, despite those handicaps. And some of them are uh, amazing in their desire to reach out among them. But God is going to require a lot more of me because I can see reasonably well. And I can hear. Used, Kathy says I used to be able to hear. <laughs> and yeah, I can talk too. And so God expects more of me than he does you, you get the idea, okay? Consider several things that the Bible suggests will be rewarded by Christ. And we're using a little bit of imagination here, but meditate on this a little bit. God is going to reward, through his Son, the seemingly insignificant things that we will have done for his glory. I was so pleased this week to see some of the team from Luxembourg after the meetings grab um, a dustpan and brush and clean up. You know, there, there are a lot of groups, maybe you're in a club like this, where people rent a, a space, they rent a building, and uh, they leave, the place is an absolute disaster when they're gone, and they say, well, that's the cleanup crews, you know, we pay for that. 
That's just insignificant things. And get the dust balls out of the corner. Clean up the, the washrooms. That's important. And, and God knows about those things, those insignificant things in the eyes of the world. God's going to reward personal sacrifice. Some of our brothers and sisters who came from Luxembourg had to put out a considerable amount of money because they have families, and some of them uh, have a very tight budget. And in your area of ministry, there are times when you make a personal sacrifice of your time and your ability or of your giving. That's going to be rewarded. God is going to reward unnoticed service. There are many things that people do that no one else knows anything about. And in fact, sometimes it is possible for us to serve in order to be noticed. And if that is our motivation, that is unworthy. What we do for Christ in secret will be counted lasting and worthy of recompense, mm. including regular prayer for other people and intercession. I think about Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12, which talks about suffering for the gospel, for doing right. God's going to reward unjust suffering for the gospel. Peter talks about this too in 1 Peter 2. If you do wrong and you suffer for it, well, you know, you don't get a medal for that. But if you do what is right and suffer unjustly, this is uh, count worthy in, in the sight of God. This, this has weight. Right? And this is a grace. Going back to Luke 14, verses 12 to 14, where Jesus is talking about the uh, motivation for inviting people over to your house. And he talks about how it's possible to invite uh, the wealthy to your home. And he says, you can invite wealthy people to your home because you figure you'll get another invitation to go to their place. But what you should do is invite the poor who can't pay you back. Check your motivation. So God's going to reward sincerity rather than a hidden <coughs> desire to receive something in return. I think about 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 17 to 18, which talks about motivations as well, intentions. God is going to reward intentions. The, the, the statement there is, it was in your heart and you did well. Now God knows your motivation, he knows my motivation, and this also is going to figure in the Bema Seat judgment. So, and we've asked a couple of questions. When is the evaluation going to take place? When we're caught up to be with Christ. How will the evaluation take place? Test by fire. What will Christ graciously reward? It's not we, it is our deeds. Quality is more important than quantity. Another question, will everybody come out the same? We're living in a culture that says um, diversity, equity, and uh, what's the I again? D I inclusion. Inclusion. Thank you. Everybody has to be on the same, a completely level playing field, right? We don't want anybody up a little higher than somebody else because if somebody is higher than somebody else, then certainly he's going to impress, uh, oppress everybody else. So we've got to just have a flat society. Everybody equal. Equity. Same outcome. Which of course doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. Never has. Never will. But maybe we come into our Bible study and think, well, when everybody appears before Christ, everybody's going to be the same. No. Well, 1 Corinthians 3 8 says um, that every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So not all believers will receive the same recompense. If this is custom made. And when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, that talks about wanting to uh, run the race well. The encouragement is to 
do so in order to receive a reward. So well, th that must certainly be a very, very selfish thing to do, to run the Christian uh, race, the, the race of the Christian life, desiring to receive a reward. Well, the scripture says you can do it. And you should do it. And so should I. Because not everybody's going to come out the same. And our hope is that there will be fewer things that are burned up and more that will last mm -hmm. by the power of God. And we are to run in order to win the race and to receive the reward. Because it is possible to run the race and be disqualified. Second Timothy chapter 2. Two more questions. What will the rewards be? Well, there, there are a couple of things that we could uh, deduce from Scripture. One is that the different crowns that are mentioned in Scripture will certainly be one facet of Christ's reward. There are quite a number of crowns that are mentioned in the New Testament. There's the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4, 7-8, which is given to all who love Christ's appearing. Is the crown of righteousness. I, I think what this is, is the crown of the righteousness of Christ in all its lived out reality. The, the works of righteousness, which will have been laid up ahead of time. The righteous deeds of the saints, which is portrayed in uh, Revelation 19 as the, the white linen of the, the garments of the church. The crown of righteousness is the crown which is Righteousness, our righteous acts. There's the crown of rejoicing, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, Philippians 4, 1. The crown of rejoicing is not, you know, a designer line of gold that you put on your head. Because the context makes it very clear. That when Paul asks the question, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you? So people are the crown of rejoicing. You know, what really catches my uh, imagination sometimes is just to think about the different people that the ministry of the Word has, um, has, um, has changed by God's power over the years in a, in a believer's life. And, and especially people that we've completely lost track of or we didn't know anything about what God was doing in someone's life. You, you don't know, if you are a faithful believer, your impact in ministry is far beyond what you can imagine. Amen. Really? I remember years ago there was a couple that came to the church in Luxembourg. They were with, they were there one Sunday. Hmm. Just one Sunday. Just, I don't, know, don't remember if they were studying or passing through on holiday. But they wrote us afterwards and said that that Sunday at the church really was used by God to reorient their priorities in their lives. I don't think that it was any particularly, you know, um, great singing or you know, wonderful piano playing or a particularly large number of people who came or a special sermon. I have no idea what it was anymore. But I thought if that's true and somebody wants to write back and, and express uh, appreciation for that, how many other times does something that we are not aware of really mark somebody's life and reorients the life. And God is going to you know, make that part of the crown of rejoicing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there are a whole lot of people who showed up in heaven that you don't even know about, mm -hmm. but who came to know Christ because you were faithful somewhere, and they are your crown of rejoicing. Wow! This was worth it after all. I'm going to keep being faithful uh, when we think about that. By then, it will be too late to change anything. You can't go back and say, I'd, I'd like to realign my priorities. The idea is that since we know ahead of time that people impacted by, by um, Christ-driven ministry will be our crown of rejoicing, then this is what we ought to be giving priority to in this life. Yeah. 
There's the crown of life, so the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life in Revelation 2, verse 10, and James 1, 12. Be faithful unto death, you're going to receive the crown of life. I'm not sure that that is a, an actual crown, or it could be what we call in grammar the positive, the, the genitive appositive, that is the crown which is life. You, you can use the word of that way. The crown of life is the crown which is life. So don't be afraid of death because you're going to be crowned with, with eternal life one day. That'll be a reward. The crown of glory for elders who serve as examples to their flock, 1 Peter 5, 4. Very often, pastoral work is not a, a, a kind of work where you get a lot of glory. A lot of pastors, and particularly this was true in the first century, they really got kicked around. They were persecuted by the Roman authorities as time went along, and when you got into the second half of the first century, leaders of the churches knew that they were going to be burned on a piece of wood to make light for Nero's parties, or they were going to be fed to the lions and the tigers in the arena. Well, don't worry about that. You've got a crown of glory coming. If you receive little glory now, there's going to be an unfading crown of glory coming. An unfading crown, 1 Corinthians 9.25, for those who maintain self-control in all things. An unfading crown. I think these are all different ways of looking at the fact there's going to be an eternal recompense, an eternal reward. And some of this will, will be an ability to reflect the glory of God in eternity. Daniel 12, 1 and 2 talks about when the judgment comes and some will shine as stars and some will shine more than others. The neat thing is that uh, how, however much you can shine, however much glory God gives you, you'll be well content with it. And the competition will be over because we'll all recognize that if we are given any reward, it will be by God's grace. Amen. What about those whose works do not pass the test? There is a negative outcome here, isn't there, in verse 15. If a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. There can be a loss of reward, suffering for living in an unworthy manner, even though the person will be saved as by fire. So that disobedience forfeits what otherwise could have been a reward. And I think there's another dimension that is indicated in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, that talks about shame. And we all understand this. When someone has given us a job to do, and we kind of fritter away our time, and um, the time comes for us to deliver the goods, and whoever has given us the job uh, comes onto the scene, and uh, we're caught not having fulfilled our mission, and we're embarrassed. And if we're walking in the flesh, we come up with some kind of a lame excuse. Well, yeah, you have to understand that this, you know, it was rainy outside, couldn't do it. Or that sunshine is good outside, I have to go out to the beach and get suntan. Well, all kinds of excuses. But on the Bema Seat judgment, there will be no excuse. And so, one of the dimensions of works burned up will certainly be shame. Not that it will last eternally, but when we see the Lord, there are some things that we will be ashamed of. If we do not abide in Him, we will certainly be ashamed. 1 John 2, 28. There is some debate about who the 24 elders are in Revelation 4. There's some who believe that these are angels, possible. Some believe that it is a, a picture of the church who are before um, the Father and before the Lamb. And the passage there pictures what the Apostle John saw in his vision, that the 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne. And if this is representing the church, then the text suggests that rewarded believers 
with, will acknowledge that all has been done by Jesus' enabling. In other words, this is all by grace. You know, there's a really wonderful truth that I, I think really comes through in the New Testament. And that is this, that if Christians can look forward to a reward or a recompense, it will not be because they've earned it. It will be by grace. Have you as a parent ever given a reward to your child who didn't earn a recompense? We all know what that's like. You say, well, I'm really embarrassed. I, thanks for this, but I, didn't, I don't deserve this. Uh, yeah, I'd like to give it back to you. We understand what that means. And there's going to be a good deal of that, I believe, when we stand before Christ. And by his grace, he gives us a recompense, feedback, and commendation, which we don't merit. And yet it really will be a recompense. It's not just uh, some kind of a pie in the sky vision. Does the promise of a reward motivate most people? I know there are some people who read this and say, well, this is very carnal, you know, this whole thing about rewards and recompense. We believe in salvation by grace. And, uh, the living for a reward is somehow unworthy of the gospel. Does the promise of a reward motivate most people? Will an Olympic athlete discipline himself and work for years to be able to have a few minutes, just a few minutes, where he stands up on that podium and he gets third place, second place, or first place? You know, by the way, that the person who gets third place is the happiest? Because the second wishes he could have been first. And the first wonders, what, do you, what can he do now to top this? And the third is just happy that he got there. Because he could have been fourth, and then he wouldn't have been there at all. But, you, I mean, boy, the amount of effort and discipline and care and exercise and agony for any sport to just have that fleeting moment of a piece of gold, you know, metal hanging around your neck, and everybody applauding, and the confetti goes up in the air. Are people motivated by rewards? You better believe they are. Do you think God knows human nature? <laughs> Why does he use this kind of language to spur us on? Because he knows that we're motivated to serve him faithfully and to follow the principles of Scripture if, if we know that we are not wasting our lives, that there is something at the end of the race where God's going to say, you did it well. Mm. Just as people reward achievement over a period of time, so the Bible assures us that the God who saved us will also reward faithfulness to the gospel and the Son of God when we stand before him. There will be no condemnation, only commendation in proportion to the faithfulness of one's Christian life. Many details about this part of God's plan are just not yet revealed in Scripture that there's enough to make us look forward. We, re we realize that rewards for faithfulness will be given by grace. We will not all be the same in the eternal state, but all of us will be equally justified and sanctified and glorified, and no, no one will be unhappy with the outcome. All of us will echo the sentiments of the servants, in Luke's Gospel, who said, when we will have done all that our Master required, we are unprofitable servants. We've only done what was asked of us. I've, I've only followed the instructions. I don't deserve any commendation. May God help us in these days of tremendous uncertainty in our world to keep the day of our final accounting before our eyes. May we be laying up treasure for ourselves in heaven, a good foundation for the life to come. Amen. What you do this week makes a difference in eternity. Amen. If you don't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then all of this material that we've looked at here this afternoon really doesn't yet apply to you because your only expectation can be that you will suffer eternal punishment. And that's what we do deserve. Being far from the presence of God 
never being able to fully repent, never being able to change our minds, living in a place that is reserved for those who hate God in this life and are never able to come back. And that will go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That is a terrible thought. And those who don't know Christ will be assessed before that time of judgment and will be judged in some way that is not fully uh, uh, clear to us either. But don't play with that. If you do not yet know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to put your trust in Him. Because God sent His Son to die for you, for your disobedience, even to your mother and daddy, so that you don't have to live forever far from Him, you can live with him and be rewarded and recompensed for those unseen, seemingly insignificant acts of, the, of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for these passages that give us hope and that motivate us, help us to remember them as we go into this week. Thank you for the energy that you give.